Association of Privacy Professionals based in the US and also a law professor at the College of Management School of Law, Michel Minhal, currently on a leave of absence from that role. Uh, sitting here to my left, to your right, is Maureen Olhausen. Maureen was sworn in as commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, in 2012. Prior to joining the commission, she was a, par a partner at Wilkinson Barker, where she focused about uh, mainly FTC issues, so competition law, uh, consumer protection, and, uh, privacy and technology policy. Uh, and before that, she spent uh, more than a decade at the FTC as a staff member, um, most recently as director of the Office of Policy Planning. Uh, on Maureen's left and at your right uh, is Amit Ashkenazi. Amit, Amit is the legal advisor to the Cyber Bureau in the Prime Minister's office. Uh, before that, he headed the legal department at ELITA, the uh, Israeli Law and Information Technologies uh, Authority. So he has both uh, cybersecurity and privacy policy. Uh, and before that, he was uh, in the Ministry of Justice for uh, um, <laughs> a fair number of years. Uh, and I also I want to apologize for the absence of uh, Professor Michael Biernak from Tel Aviv University, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, due to a uh, personal issue. Um, so, uh, just to set the stage for this discussion, I thought it would be useful to say a few words on what cybersecurity policy is. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of talk over the past few years about cyber generally as an industry uh, and about, about cyber policy as a legal and uh, oftentimes now diplomatic issue. Uh, but I, I feel it's important to kind of focus on what is it we mean when we talk about cybersecurity policy. And I suggest we look at it as four different buckets. One of them is the regulation of data security. Uh, and fortunately for us in this panel, Maureen Olhausen as a commissioner and uh, FTC more generally is probably the leading regulator in the world now, not only in the US, dealing with uh, enforcement of uh, data security practices. Uh, so, uh, data security is one bucket. Another bucket is uh, security breach notification. And uh, I, I'm not sure, I think, you know, the lawyers here probably know that this field uh, emerged in the beginning of uh, the last decade. So, 2003, California legislated the first security breach notification law requiring organizations to report to their consumers or to a regulator when they encounter a data security breach. And needless to say, we've seen a lot of activity on this front play out in the press over the uh, past uh, years. And you know, it seems to just uh, be on the up and up, accelerating all the time. 
Uh, the third bucket I suggest is cyber threat data sharing. So cybersecurity data sharing, uh, which, and, and I think here uh, many people in the industry know that it's very difficult for businesses to kind of fend off against these threats on their own. They need to collaborate with other businesses and oftentimes with the government to obtain uh, intelligence and obtain information about what they might be facing and sometimes to coordinate the uh, response. And I think to a great extent that's what the Cyber Bureau and the Prime Minister's office is doing and Amit can tell us more about that. And then the fourth area is the hackback offense vector, which I think we will not actually address here, but it's another area of cyber security um, policy which uh, actually kind of grows to prominence over the past year or two. So data security, security breach identification, cyber threat data sharing, I think those are the buckets that we will engage here. Uh, and then, you know, just keep in mind that there's also the hackback offense uh, issue. So with that, just sort of setting the table to what it is we want to talk about, I'll let each one of the speakers uh, say a few words, uh, five to seven minute introduction, and then we will have a discussion. Well, th thank you so so much, Omer. I'm delighted uh, to be here. Uh, it's my first visit to Israel, and I've really enjoyed it very much so far. Uh, but why might you be interested to hear from an FTC commissioner? Uh, the FTC is a bipartisan law enforcement agency in the U.S. with authority over commercial practices. So we don't play a role in national security kinds of issues, but more about how companies collect and secure and use and share data about their consumers. Uh, we're also an antitrust agency, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in connection with the sharing of uh, cyber threat information. But turning to the consumer protection front, you've heard a lot today about the different risks, the different vectors where threats can be coming. Uh, you can have them on you know, all kinds of devices, networks, things like that. What's the FTC's role here? So what we have, uh, we have two types of authority in the consumer protection area, deception. So if you've made a promise to consumers about how you're going to collect their information, share it, and secure it, and you don't meet that promise, you can be liable to the Federal Trade Commission. But uh, most of our work in the cybersecurity area has actually focused under another type of authority we call unfairness. So if you have sensitive consumer information and you have failed to secure it in a way that uh, raises the risk of harm to consumers, the FTC can bring an enforcement action against you uh, if you're operating in the US. So we have brought more than 50 data security cases against some of the biggest companies, ones that you know, are everyday uh, names. Uh, so we brought it against uh, uh, entities like um, Facebook, Google, Twitter, uh, handset manufacturers, we mentioned H HTC. Uh, across all, uh, anything that is consumer facing or that has an impact on consumers. So sometimes it can be a, a you know, third party in, in the chain. If you, take, if you fail to take reasonable precautions to protect the data that you hold uh, for consumers, and that can be precautions against outside threats, that can also be precautions against insider threats, where you have um, somebody in the organization who has unauthorized access uh, to, to your data. The FTC can bring an enforcement action. Um, so we are, uh, we've also brought um, many, many cases involving spam and spyware. And we, we try to keep up with the evolving threats that all of you are, are facing and trying to, to counter uh, through the types of um, services and uh, products that have been discussed today. So the data privacy and cybersecurity is really part, I would say cybersecurity is really part of our larger privacy mission at the Federal Trade Commission. If you have information from consumers and you fail to secure it or protect it appropriately, that can certainly have a privacy impact on consumers. And one of the things that companies have said they would like to do is to be able to share some of the cyber threat information so that they can take better steps to protect themselves. And one of the concerns that they've raised about this is that could that raise any trust concerns? Is that something where you have competitors getting together and they're sharing information uh, often that's something that an antitrust enforcer looks at kind of uh, with, with great suspicion. 
Uh, so one of the things that we've done in the U.S. is the Federal Trade Commission is uh, an antitrust enforcer, as is the U.S. Department of Justice. And we issued joint uh, guidelines last year to give companies some comfort uh, about getting together to share this kind of cyber threat information. Uh, to say that that doesn't seem to be the type of commercially sensitive information uh, that we would be concerned about competitors sharing. So that we're trying to allow companies to have um, the room to get together and to uh, try to take steps to better protect um, consumers. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think our, our discussion will also talk about this. So as I mentioned, uh, Data security uh, we see as a subset of privacy uh, at the FTC. But sometimes privacy and security can be in tension with each other. Sometimes security means that we want more information about consumers, that we want to know more about who's using this service, who's uh, make, making, uh, taking these steps. And that sometimes can be, can be a, a, in tension with privacy concerns. Uh, certainly there are other concerns about liberty, uh, about uh, public, uh, you know, public uh, discussion, about freedom of expression, that all come into play and that I think make uh, privacy and data security a particularly um, interesting area for, for debate. And I look forward to our discussion. Uh, so thank you. And maybe a, a short follow-up question. Um, uh, many people who are active in this space know that the FTC is enforcing both privacy and data security uh, to a great extent in the absence of specific uh, regulatory statutes that actually set forth rules about what uh, you know, reasonable data security might be. So, um, you know, just to give you um, uh, kind of a bit of a background about this, the FTC is enforcing uh, in this space, a law from 1914, if I'm not mistaken, uh, maybe the specific section is from... 1938. 38, yeah, 1938, uh, which uh, authorizes the agency to act against unfair or deceptive trade practices. So, and into those words, the FTC has kind of poured the, its authority to act against unfair or deceptive data security practices. Uh, what's your view in terms of how specific the regulation should be in this space? So that has really become a topic uh, of great interest lately because Congress has been, uh, the U.S. Congress has been considering whether there should be specific data security and breach notification legislation. So in the U.S. we have uh, some sector specific regulation and privacy. So for financial, uh, information for medical information, there's a certain uh, level of, of privacy uh, requirements. But for all the rest of it, it's the Federal Trade Commission. So the question we've often gotten is, should the FTC be out there writing specific rules that you have to take you know, this level of protection and you have to undertake you know, those protocols? And we've sort of resisted that because I think one of the issues uh, that we've really seen, one of the uh, developments we've really seen is how fast moving a, a sector this is, how technologically fast moving it is. So it would be very difficult, I think, for a government uh, agency like the FTC to write a, um, a specific rule. Instead, what we have focused on is whether companies take the right precautions. So it's much more, I think, of a process-based kind of approach at the FTC. Do you know what information you have? What promises have you made to consumers? How do you secure it? Who has access to it? Are you checking that the third parties with whom you're sharing it uh, are doing what they told you that they would do with it? Uh, and do you have, you know, have you trained your personnel? And the types of cases that the FTC has brought in this area have focused on what we consider very basic failures of data security. So failure to train, you allow your, you allow your um, employees to have a file sharing software on it so that their people's medical information gets shared along with the uh, pirated movies that people are trying to download, that there are backup tapes that are just stored in somebody's car, uh, that your network password is password. Uh, th those are the kinds of things. It seems like low-hanging fruit, but we've, we've brought a lot of uh, actions in that area. So uh, again, we don't have a specific rule that says, you know, use this, you know, use PCI compliant or, or something like that. It's more, are your precautions reasonable given the sensitivity of the data that you have, the size of your organization, uh, and the cost of taking those precautions? 
Thanks. Uh, and Amit. Thank you. So, um, what the Bureau, the National Cyber Bureau, has been uh, doing uh, is similar to the question and the policy issues faced by many democratic states in this space. We are seeing more uh, cyber attacks, more advanced uh, potential damage and sometimes damage happening in the private sector. And uh, countries ask, ask themselves what is the role of the state in this space and specifically for this discussion, what is its policy role in uh, legislation, regulation, facilitation of what is going on in the market. And when we approach this issue, we, we have to take note of two things that uh, are uh, present. The first thing is that before it was called cyber, this domain, the internet, our smartphones and our social networks and everything else which is now cyber, uh, was a type of a sacred domain in the eyes of the law in the sense that the law and its institutions and government basically stepped aside and let innovation and information flows and financial transactions go without the government bothering them and many western countries including Israel had a policy of let's say non-intervention. And the other issue that uh, is important to set the scene, that in this space, the country, the state, its organs cannot do effective defense without cooperation of the organization, because the cyber defense battlefield, if you like, happens within organizational networks. So if uh, Sony was attacked, it doesn't matter what high-tech, uh, high, uh, I don't know, high facility, type of team would be sent in, the amount of man hours that were invested in networks before this attack requires any type of sensible defender to uh, do this defense exercise with the people that manage the network daily. So there's no override of the defense team. And this is not the case in other security areas where the, the police come and close the area or the like, army comes and close the area and conducts the battle without people uh, interfering. So with these two problems, uh, uh, the, the policy fashioned in Israel, which was, uh, I, would, I would say, enumerated in two government decisions from February 15, include two elements. The first element is uh, something that we see in a lot of uh, Western countries, and it deals with uh, the countries or the states offline role. We call it offline because it's the straightforward incentives, regulatory role, telling organizations to become more resilient, mapping to information security standards, um, and uh, this uh, policy process is based on several concepts. The first one is government leadership, so everything that we want from the private sector we apply to government, maybe even I would say government by example, so in our cabinet decision 2443, for instance, we want ministries to spend at least 8% of their IT budget for cyber security. And we set up an institutional mechanism within the ministries to manage cyber security issues, which is out of the IT department. It's a management issue, a buy-in from the top. And this type of accountability scheme is important in order for the government to, set, to say, this is how I see cyber security resilience going on in practice. The other element of this uh, uh, decision is that we are not inventing a new regulator. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. We expect each regulator in the government to deploy cyber security um, insights within its existing regulatory functions, uh, except for one area which is the cyber security services market in which we see at the present a vacuum and in this area, more work needs to be done in order to uh, make the service security market more efficient. Because if all this pressure is on firms to buy cyber security services, but there may be a, a lack of understanding between clients and service providers about what is the service and its nature and its quality, then some of this spending for cyber security may be inefficient. So that's one element of the policy. The other element of the policy is the online role of the state. The online role in the, in the fire brigade metaphor. The fire brigade comes to help and to assist and uh, to locate a fire even before we uh, catch the, the guy that set the fire. And in this context we need something to mitigate attacks even before we mitigate the attackers. 
So we need a, an online role for the state. Uh, one of the major elements of this concept is a, a CERP, a cyber event response team, which acts in the online world. But we bring governmental assets uh, into this operation, and it's going to be inside a national cyber security, cyber defense authority. And uh, this uh, mission, uh, mission cyberization, an authority for cyber security defense, has two advantages in this space. The first is that we look, and this is, this is coming from our people looking strategically, it's not a legal, um, not a legal uh, issue, that this space requires a totally new doctrine. It's not an extension of something that has happened before. So we need somebody that is look, looks at the space uh, coast to coast, uh, if you like. And this, of course, is a very valuable thing in the cybersecurity civil rights intersection because we have an authority that is focused on what's going on in the machines and uh, not um, interested, at least at, at first, at what their users are doing. And in this sense, it is different than uh, other agencies which are interested in the cyber domain, I think, that's okay. Thanks, I mean, so, uh, uh, just following up on that, I think, and actually on both of your comments, I think there emerges here sort of two distinct models for the role of the state in cybersecurity. And we have to keep in mind that this space is mostly civilian and commercial, it's not a military space, and also that it's very much an international, it's a global space. And with this in mind, I think um, Maureen's uh, model, the FTC, is a government agency or an independent uh, uh, oversight agency that tells businesses you should do a good job protecting your uh, networks and protecting your consumers' information. And on the other hand, a model where the state actually plays an active role and says, I'm going to provide some of this information or to coordinate among businesses in order for them to have more robust protection. And I, I just want to point out that it's not a geographical difference because in, uh, Israel has uh, um, the FTC type uh, uh, enforcement agency in Elita that um, Amit was a part of uh, before this. And the U.S., of course, has the DHS as a sort of a national cert and the NSA for the intelligence side. So, so both countries have both models, but I'm wondering which one do, you know, the, the, do these models sort of uh, uh, conflict or do they somehow uh, add on to each other? Amit? So uh, our view is that these things are uh, uh, complementary. You need both the online capacity and the offline capacity. Of course, uh, organizations have to put in defenses in order to manage their daily security. But then I think uh, one of the most illustrative examples is that the famous target breach or the infamous target breach. So when you look at the timeline of the attack, at the same time that the attackers more or less attacked the air conditioning of the store someplace and slowly escalated their way to credit card information. At the same time, basically, Target was uh, PCI compliant. And PCI is quite a tough standard. To be compliant to it allows to credit card information. So the, the thing is that these elements are complementary. In our view, and this is what uh, the INCB head calls the, not the advantage of being big, but the advantage of being small, being a smaller country. With a smaller administration, maybe an advantage that we can leverage here and put these functions within one body. Hope this answers your question. So, Maureen, I think what Amit is saying is that regardless of companies' compliance with even the best standards, where the FTC can basically you know, not say anything because their PCI DSS or ISO 27001 compliant. Uh, government still has a role to play because some uh, attacks uh, businesses just can't deal with. Do you, do you agree? Uh, I, I do agree with that. So there are other parts of the U.S. government uh, that may give advice or guidance or have requirements about network security and uh, things like that. But for, for the FTC, we actually investigate 
uh, many, many, many of these data breaches, uh, the, the most well-known ones, uh, some lesser-known ones, and some of the things that we, uh, you know, try to convey. So our investigations are typically non-public, uh, though a few have been confirmed, such as our investigation of Target. Uh, for, for their data breach. So uh, one of the things that we look for is whether there's a systemic or systematic failure, not whether uh, there, it's not a strict liability standard. It isn't that you had a breach and therefore you're liable because I'm not sure that that would be a, appropriate, an appropriate standard uh, for companies to be subject to because some of these threats, some of these attacks are like in the Sony uh, case, you know, it's a nation-state attack. You can't necessarily assume that an individual company can withstand that. So, what do we look for when we do when we do these investigations? We look to see: Have you taken uh, appropriate precautions? Have you trained your staff? Have you kept up with you know the patches, the the, the well-known threats that are coming through? Have you disabled certain safety features and then failed to re-enable them? We actually brought a case against a well-known app that, um, called Pandango that had disabled. Uh, its SSL certification while it was going to beta testing and then never re-enabled it, so it allowed man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, those kinds of things. Have you taken, you know, the, the right steps, right precautions? But we, so for every, basically, every investigation that we bring an enforcement action, a data breach, an enforcement action against, we've closed about two and a half investigations without, without any action. So it, it's not a, you know, gotcha, uh, strict liability thing, but more that we're really looking for either one spectacular, uh, you know, failure uh, of, of protection or more of like systemic kinds of approaches. And the other thing that we try to do is uh, to give guidance to companies. Uh, the biggest companies really, uh, you know, they have the lawyers, they have the, the security experts to, to guide them. But a lot of these breaches happen in medium sized and small businesses. And they can have uh, consumer harms as well. So we try to give advice uh, to businesses, uh, and particularly to reach out to the startup community, uh, because they're usually trying to uh, create something so quickly, they're sometimes overlooking some of those basic precautions. So we feel that consumers are better off if we can give uh, companies some information so that they can take the appropriate precautions and forestall any consumer harm. Or uh, you know, uh, preventing from happening. So it's a, that's a better investment of our resources. I just wanted to add something else, um, which may be obvious, but uh, is that and is that government has a role as a monopoly of legislation and policy making. So there are a lot of things which the, the companies can do to better protect themselves, in which the, the government can create a more facilitating legal environment. And Maureen mentioned the issue of information sharing. So by an offline action, something that's saying this is legal, this is something we can do, and uh, you can do actually, then it uh, immediately enables companies to better defend themselves. I think one of the most successful operations in this area in the US is the FS ISACs, um, uh, and uh, the ISACs in general, and the FS ISAC specifically, and it shares information between financial institutions. Without the government, only the government said it's okay. So government has a role here in also creating a friendly environment. And we see it in other areas of the law where uh, uh, the government doesn't have to do anything directly, but it has to maybe move aside obstacles or re-engineer the law in order to enable um, more effective defense. Okay, so that, that I think is a good segue to sort of talk a bit about uh, cyber threat data sharing. And as you say, there are legal obstacles to that. Maureen already mentioned the antitrust issues, which uh, the FTC and the DOJ together issued a statement about that they want to pursue um, the, this type of sharing for cybersecurity purposes. Um, and uh, there are other impediments, and I want to focus specifically on the uh, tension here between data security and privacy. Uh, so, you know, to kind of lay out the bare bones argument, uh, from the data security side, you want to collect as much information as you can in order to, you know, see the, uh, the correlations and the trends and to detect this needle in the haystack of a, of a threat and to be able to deal with it. 
On the other side, of course, from the privacy side, the more information you collect and the more you, uh, information you analyze, you collect, uh, you create uh, privacy risks. So I'm wondering how you see, you know, the uh, solution or how you see mitigation of uh, this uh, tension, considering that if you don't, you know, you can't find the needle in the haystack if you don't create the haystack. I think uh, General Alexander, the head of the FBI, said that. On, a, on the other hand, inevitably, if you have the haystack, then you have like sometimes a serious uh, threat to civil liberties. Uh, you want to start with me? So I think that uh, the, the, this uh, discussion, which has become very heated in the recent years, is a bit simpler in the cybersecurity domain because um, we're focusing on how our cyber uh, ecosystem is functioning. And basically, our major uh, uh, aim is not what uh, people are thinking and doing. I'm saying this on the, 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 the beginning of the haystack, okay? Is the, what are machines and other things doing? Because this is where our forensic analysts are looking for, and this is where we see the signs and the trends uh, that are troubling us. The other thing that we have at our aid is the fact that we have this uh, specific mission which is focused on the cybersecurity, and as mentioned, in many areas, cybersecurity promotes data protection and privacy. I mean, my, the, ma some of the major cybersecurity events are actually data breach privacy events. So these areas merge. And the third thing is that we have to utilize what we know about uh, smart uh, designing of systems and uh, mitigating these risks. So in a discussion we had yesterday, we heard from a leading vendor in Israel about the way they uh, um, design the system so that indeed a lot of things are collected but then access is by a machine process and the algorithm is calibrated in a certain way and other, a further uses of the information is strictly, let's say, regulated by processes. So it's not just a big haystack that anybody can go and look in, uh, but the technology can help us in uh, streamlining um, streamlining the, the way we use this, uh, this information. And again, remember that we're looking for cybersecurity related information and not about other things in this context, and this helps us. Of course, it would be naive to say that this is a black or white solution. It's a, it's a gray area where we have to develop policy smartly, and each of the sides, the data protection, privacy, and the cybersecurity, have to um, look uh, realistically at what technology wants and what are the actual risks at the end of the day. So I think um, the way we should look at it is we should do what we can to um, mitigate privacy risks and uh, do the cost-benefit analysis at the end. Maureen? Uh, so I think there are two issues there. One is uh, if companies are sharing cyber threat information, it seems unlikely to me that they would need to share the personally identifiable information of their customers, right? So if you had a, uh, an attack uh, that got credit card information, I don't think you'd have to say, and it got, you know, Maureen Olhausen's credit card and her number is X, right? So I think uh, it's the type of attack. But I think in cybersecurity, um, there is also this issue of authentication, right? We want to make sure that the person accessing this service or this database is the right person. And how do you do that? Often by collecting additional information about that person. Uh, and then once you have that information, so, it, so uh, collecting more information can help serve privacy, uh, you know, uh, sort of it's counterintuitive a bit that sometimes you collect more information to better protect privacy uh, and security, but uh, um, data security. But the issue there then is safeguarding that, safeguarding credentials, safeguarding uh, the kind of authenticator uh, that, that's been used in that, in that regard. And so I think uh, th that's one of the most challenging areas, right? So every time we collect more information to authenticate its view, uh, how is that information um, stored? Uh, it's one of the challenges that uh, we've discussed um, just in and we do a lot of policy work with the FTC. Once we go to biometrics, 
right? So once uh, your your um, you know your eyeball scan is going to authenticate you, uh, that's harder to change than your password, right? So if, if that if that information gets gets hacked and, and uh, can be used by somebody else, who can just you know put in those data points. What does the consumer do? They can't just go change their their password in the same way. So that's that's one of the challenges. It's sort of it's a little bit of a, an arms race, I think. So, so you, you know, clearly there is some overlap between privacy and security. Nobody denies that. And uh, in fact, one of the principles of privacy law is always data security, because in the absence of any security, you won't have privacy. The data will be out there. However, there is a, a difference and a gap. And I kind of want to push back, Amit, against your um, statement that uh, uh, for cyber purposes you're only interested in data about the machine as about uh, as opposed to data about people and uh, inquire whether you can actually make this distinction because the risks and the threats don't distinguish between you know content and metadata or traffic data the risk can be in the body of an email if it's a phishing attack uh, the risk can be embedded in a photo, in a JPEG, uh, which is, you know, I think um, ostensibly at least uh, content as opposed to metadata. So, so how do you actually make this distinction? And, you know, the fact of the matter is that when uh, countries try to legislate this, for example, the CISPA in the U.S. unraveled because of privacy concerns and the inability to kind of um, take these two things apart. I mean, okay, so it's a good question. And uh, actually, I'm going through this exercise because uh, one of the things that came from the cabinet decision which set up the authority uh, is that the National Cert has to operate according to principles, taking into account basic rights and the Attorney General in the Ministry of Justice, which is the highest legal authority in the Israeli executive branch, uh, is going Who to... Who is also in charge of law enforcement and national security. Yes, exactly. But I think in this case they're looking at it basically from a human rights perspective. So uh, they're, they're doing sort of check on what we're doing. So I think the answer here is in the details. Uh, not every time we need everything from the content. And as Maureen uh, ex uh, pointed correctly, a lot of information sharing is really technical and does not relate to content. So this is something that we can work with. Uh, and if you add to this the ability to calibrate machines to do most of the scanning, then the, the, the the event when you need to look at content would be triggered by something. And uh, this is an, I mean, it, it should, I mean, we're getting a bit maybe more technical here, but it depends whether you're looking at um, revealing a trend or whether you're actually investigating a cyber event. So when you're investigating a cyber event ex post after something bad happened, obviously you need access to everything. But we're talking about things that you, know, you want to do in order to mitigate things in advance. You want to have a, let's say, radar of the cyber, uh, cyber space and uh, look at where the bad things are coming from and where they're going in your systems. And at this point, uh, not every time you need to, in, to uh, inspect every bit of content by a human. So basically, we can differentiate between uh, information that is not privacy sensitive, metadata, and things which may be privacy sensitive, but we try to create an algorithm or a funneling system in which uh, these events are very minimal, and then you have to escalate in your permission list in order to enable them. So it's, uh, this is the way, and then of course, when such a process happens, this leaves traces so you can do some sort of audit about who did what and why. And uh, I think that these are the basic mitigation practices in any, in any type of system that deals with sensitive data. Maureen, you want to chime in on this? Um, well, well, I mean, I think, I think you, you put it just right. You know, that we can't maximize all values at once. We can't have perfect privacy, perfect security, uh, open commerce, free innovation, and, you know, and all of those things, right? There's always going to be, be trade-offs. Uh, but, but I think that there are 
tools that can be used to minimize some of the uh, some of the effects on privacy. You mentioned, um, you know, using machines to do it. That we certainly have um, anonymization. We have hashing. We have differential uh, information that that, that are, are techniques. I, I would say none of them are perfect. Uh, and sometimes I, I get a little frustrated because I feel that some of the debate uh, in the U.S. at least evolves into, well, it's, it's not a perfect solution for, for everything. You say, well, you know, that's pretty much the answer to most debates. There's not a perfect solution to everything. But there are reasonable steps that can be taken to, um, to balance the, those two types of concerns. So, so I think you raised two uh, distinct mechanisms to maybe minimize privacy risks while maximizing the data security uh, goal. One of them is automated uh, processing as opposed to sort of human uh, intervention. And I want to leave that one on the side, maybe get back to it, because I want to actually question whether it mitigates privacy risks, given that we're dealing with, you know, big data and such enormous quantities of data that nobody would think that the human is actually sifting through all of this. Um, uh, but talk about the second mitigation strategy that you both uh, raised, which is anonymization or de-identification. And um, uh, so, so uh, you know, I think in the past we thought that de-identifying de data was kind of a silver bullet. It allows you to have the cake and eat it too. Uh, you can do the data analysis, sophisticated data analysis, you can draw lessons and yet not infringe on anyone's privacy because most of the times you don't really care about who the individuals are, as a matter of fact. However, uh, the computer science community has shown us over the past few years that de-identification is often much more fickle than we thought. It's reversible, de-identified data can readily be re-identified, and uh, uh, you know, people treat it very much like in data security terms of an attack, an adversary, and you can often attack de-identification and re-identify data even if it's been scrubbed uh, um, pretty vigorously, and there were some prominent examples, if I had more time we would talk about them, but uh, we don't. Uh, how, uh, uh, how good is, the ident is good de-identification? Like, what does a company need to do in order to be able to say with some degree of confidence, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the FTC or vis-a-vis -vis its consumers, that data are de-identified? Uh, so, uh, you, you're right, there is no, I think, perfect de-identification that, that can happen, and with enough computing power thrown at it, you can probably uh, re-identify. I think the, the question is, um, always compared to what, right? What are you losing, what are you gaining? Uh, and then I think one of the other things is, okay, can it be re-identified, but how difficult would it be? Uh, but also, are you sharing it with others who have made a promise not to re-identify it for their uses? And then is that promise enforceable? So that's often what we look at at, at, um, uh, at the FTC is, have you, you know, you've de-identified the data, how have you used it? Have you re-identified it in a way you promised not to? Or have you shared it with someone uh, who hasn't made a promise? Uh, not to re-identify it. So it, it often comes down to more of a contractual kind of approach to say, yes, you're going to have access to this, but you have to promise you won't try to re-identify it. So in a way, there are uh, two tranches here. One is technological, so good enough uh, de-identification from a technological standpoint, and then on top of that, a commitment not to re-identify and uh, downstream obligations that you impose on your service provider, or business associate, or whatever, yes? Yes, that's, that's what we looked at at the FTC. Amit. So basically, these are the two tools we have. And I, I would just say, maybe to take the discussion a bit further in the technical sense, the ICO, the Information Commissioners in the UK, who is also uh, the Commissioner for Freedom of Information, so this is the law that makes you want to publish things. And today we're talking about publishing databases. So they have a conflict of interest between publishing things and protecting privacy. They published a very good manual on anonymization. And it has a lot of tools there. And these tools, 
their utility is contextual. So in some cases it would be anonymization, in other areas it would be tokenization. And I guess what you would look for in a specific context is one, what would a reasonable uh, attack be against this, uh, this type of uh, anonymization technique? And is it reasonable in the context used? Because if it's not reasonable, it's not. So I, I don't see it as a problem. And always you have to carry a big legal stick for everybody who accesses the data in order to create, um, I guess, the penalties so people don't try anything silly. It's also symbolic, I think. So it's always about the technological things, and these are moving forward. And I think that in the cybersecurity context, we can be more optimistic than in other areas. Because in other areas, the, the, the privacy dilemma and the value dilemmas which we face every day as consumers, as parents, as people, what is privacy on social networks and so on, these dilemmas are a bit simpler than cybersecurity, I think. Because the context is of the use is security, people basically want security, and uh, if you can uh, um, make, give assurances that you're focused on security, and not on other things, for instance, marketing to people, which is the basic use in data, maybe it's, there is less danger of conflict of interest, the identification, etc. So, so this is a technology and business uh, conference, and we are glad to have like our little uh, policy corner here. The lawyers, you know, get a little say. We're grateful for that. And uh, 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 you know, uh, joking aside, there has been a very strong sentiment in Silicon Valley, especially in, uh, sort of an uh, offshoot of the Snowden revelations and the NSA story that uh, the government should just lay off and take its hands off of the technology industry. And whatever government does, it messes it up. Technology is innovation and it's, uh, you know, and it's about being nimble and quick and it's just not the lawyer or government things. We, we don't operate this way. Do you think, uh, do, do you see the government as having been um, su successful both as a regulator and as an actual player in this space? And what do you foresee for the future? Well, judging by the number of uh, very well-known technology companies that we currently have under order for privacy and data security violations, I don't know whether we've been successful or spectacularly unsuccessful, but we've certainly gotten their attention. Um, I think that it is, uh, you know, it depends on how the government gets involved, right? I think that's always a question of what's your approach. Our approach has been, you don't need our permission from the FTC to do, to do things. What you need to do is keep the promises that you made to consumers and make sure that your practices are not causing substantial harm to consumers. And we define substantial harm as a risk to consumers, like financial information, medical information, health uh, and safety, information about their children. Uh, we recently put out an Internet of Things report. Uh, we did a workshop on that, and we didn't recommend any new Internet of Things uh, legislation. What we said is that the basic rules still apply in, in this new world, and that companies uh, should make sure to take steps to protect consumer information uh, and consumer privacy in this space, particularly in an emerging technology, to make sure that consumer and market confidence uh, can continue to grow in this new, this new area. So um, basically the approach of the Bureau is very light touch. So when we're talking about doing the online activities, we're building on public <coughs> firms. And in this space we have to be very attractive and convince firms to share information with us, to trust us. And this is, a, this is an issue which will have legal implications, what we promise, and what we, uh, how we create their trust. That's why we will have robust privacy protections in our processes and we will apply them also outside the domain of PII, of personal information, but also about company sensitive information. So we apply the same processes there in order to create trust. And um, in this context, uh, I think that uh, on the one hand, uh, bad things are being said about government and some of them are true. On the other hand, in this space, we see more and more a call for government to come in because of the risks. The, the, the amount of risks call for a governmental intervention, governmental assistance, uh, in order to help firms uh, uh, deal with the, the challenges of cyber defense. 
and the government has to do this very carefully. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, this is clearly a new emergent field in law and policy uh, on both uh, cybersecurity and privacy and it deals with really the most fundamental uh, freedoms and human rights and also with the international issues and globalization by the very nature of the uh, technology and the architecture here. We've only touched the tip of the iceberg, but uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion and maybe we'll continue in the halls after. Thank you very much.